Today on Zestology, the absolute best time to eat dinner and other hacks for optimising sleep and circadian rhythms. I'm Tony Wrighton. Uh, this is the podcast all about energy, vitality and motivation. I'm down by the river in London and Greg Potter PhD's work on sleep, diet and metabolic health have been featured all over the world. Greg really knows his stuff. He's big into looking at fasting, diet, and using the rhythms of the day to enhance your health. You may be surprised, actually, at the absolute best time to eat dinner and the research behind it and how it might improve your heart rate, heart rate variability and sleep as well. You can probably hear a lot of the sounds of nature in the background, a lot of birds down by the river today. And um, one of Greg's big things is optimising our natural cycles with the natural world. So it feels very appropriate that I'm, walk- I'm recording this down by the river. I'm walking down here at the moment. And I think you'll like uh, Greg Potter. Since I recorded this podcast, which was only a few days ago, my heart rate variability has massively increased overnight. And I obviously ch- uh, track that with the Aura Ring. And that is because of Greg's suggestions. So I, I highly recommend them. I heartily recommend them. Here he is, Greg Potter on Zestology. We are recording now. Greg, great to talk to you. Thanks for doing this. Pleasure. Great to be here. I thought a good place to start would be to ask you about what you do and in uh, particular, chrononutrition. Am I saying that right? Yeah, some people say chrononutrition as in chronological, but yes, absolutely. And in terms of what I do, I suspect that you mean regarding my professional work yes I, although it, we may well come on to you moving to one of the great blue zones of the world at some <laughs> point in this conversation yeah if that ever happens <laughs> but yes in short i am co-founder and chief science officer of a company named resilient nutrition which is a startup that we began working on this year. Um, we recently launched our first products, which are named Long Range Fuel. And in addition to that, I work as a health and performance consultant, working with individuals and groups to help them get more out of their days. And I got into all of this work because when I was about 12, I became interested in how to improve my health, how to look better, how to perform better in sport. And that led me on a long, long road down <coughs> towards improved health. And I ended up doing a couple of degrees in exercise science and a PhD, which focused on the intersection between sleep, biological rhythms, nutrition and metabolism. And um, I think we're going to speak about some of those things today. Yeah. And is that chrononutrition? Yeah, much of my PhD focused on chronic nutrition. But I still don't quite know what it is. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> the way that I describe chronic nutrition is that it's the relationship between what you eat and what you drink and your body's clock. And this is the clock that programs daily changes in all sorts of processes in your body, including things like your sleep-wake cycle, but also your digestion, your metabolism, and your immune function. And chrononutrition has important implications. One of those is that what and when you eat influence the function of your body's clock. And the other is that because your body's clock optimizes your body for certain things at certain times of day, you can use an understanding of your body's clock to optimize your diet to improve how you respond to the foods and drinks that you consume. And all of this is relevant because if you think about our distant ancestors, then they lived in the context of two clocks. One of these was the so-called environmental clock. So roughly 24 hour changes and things like light and dark. But the other was their biological clocks, which evolved in response to these environmental changes. And among these people, there was close synchrony between these two clocks. But around the time of the dawn of industrialization, we became able to manipulate things like our light-dark cycles. And as a result of that, a third clock, the social clock, influenced our lives more and more. And so now it's possible to distort things like our light-dark cycles and we can order fast food round the clock at the touch of a button. And 
these types of behaviors dispose us to all sorts of health problems. And this is clearly seen among populations like shift workers. Yeah, yeah. Well, not only am I a shift worker of sorts in that I tend to do quite a few late shifts. I've also, as you know, just been on holiday for a week and a half. And um, <laughs> Look, it's been in some ways it's it's wonderfully relaxing. It's great to switch off. I'm sure my parasympathetic nervous system has been kicking in very nicely. Mm. But I did eat some absolute crap for the last week and a half. <laughs> and you know, it's it's quite interesting. I've got one of these Ura rings and the difference between the nights where I was going out having kind of lobster and chips at half past nine and a couple of rum and cokes. And then we got back yesterday afternoon, had carrot soup for dinner at about 5.30. <laughs> it went to bed on time and my heart rate variability shot through the roof. So I'm fully on board with what you're saying. And I, and I just know that it does make a difference. And there has been some work showing that when people assign a smaller proportion of their daily calorie intake to the final meal of the day, you see an increase in heart rate variability and more restorative sleep. So the research very much supports your findings. Does it? Does it? Because I think that that is probably the biggest factor that improves my heart rate variability if I have a smaller evening meal. Yeah. And all sorts of other factors will, of course, affect it. Things like your patterns of physical activity and the different stresses that you're exposed to. But yes, that has been shown. And as we'll come to assigning a smaller proportion of your daily calorie intake and your carbon fat intakes in particular to the final meal is likely to have all sorts of other metabolic benefits beyond the effects on your heart rate. OK, let's come to it now then. So is that the kind of the, the, the advice bit? I know it's hard because presumably a lot of what you do is very individually tailored. But is this something that we should generally be looking to do? Less calories in the evening more at lunch yes i think so and one thing that's important to note is that if you look at how people in countries like the uk eat then they typically consume a relatively small breakfast a moderate sized lunch and a large dinner mm. and that differs according to the country that you're looking at but with that said there have been studies into several different related concepts in recent years that support the idea that consuming a relatively larger breakfast and smaller dinner is likely to be beneficial. And some of these studies have looked at so-called early time-restricted eating. And when people speak about time-restricted eating, what they're primarily referring to is confining intake of all calorie-containing items, including foods and drinks, to a period of 12 hours or less each day. Mm. And early time-restricted eating entails confining this caloric period as early in the waking day as possible. And there have been several studies published in the last few years, most of which have come from a lady named Courtney Peterson, showing the beneficial effects of this type of approach. And just to give you a couple of examples of this, the first of these studies looked at adult men who have prediabetes. And they compared spreading out three meals each day over 12 hours each day for five weeks to consuming the same three meals within a six hour period. So this was the early time restricted eating condition that finished by 3 p.m. So this is like skipping dinner. And what they found is that after the early time restricted eating period, the men had improved insulin sensitivity, which is an important determinant of your risk of disease like diabetes. They had lower measures of oxidative stress and oxidative stress is involved in things like aging. They had better appetite regulation and they had a 10 millimeter of mercury drop in morning blood pressure, which is a similar effect size to what you would experience if you took certain blood pressure lowering drugs. So there's a really quite profound changes in a relatively short period of time. And since then, that same group has shown that even within four days or so of early time restricted eating, people will experience things like lower average blood sugar levels over the course of 24 hours, increased early morning ketones. So this type of approach might be particularly helpful if somebody's on a low carb, high fat diet or a ketogenic diet and improved appetite regulation counterintuitively. When people go through this type of early time restricted eating, they may actually experience lower appetite in the evening which i think a lot of people would not anticipate 
I, I, I wouldn't anticipate that at all, no. Yeah. And the tricky thing with early time restricted eating, of course, is that a lot of people congregate at dinner. And that is a really important social time for us. And John Hawley from Australia has done some work showing that if you look at the main barriers to incorporating this type of time restricted eating approach, then they are things like work commitments and family commitments and social schedules, which may be slightly less relevant now during this global pandemic than previously, but certainly are still relevant. And so if you hear about these beneficial effects of early time restricted eating, then what I would say is that the most important thing to take home is that if you can reduce the size of your final meal of the day, then you're likely to benefit. And there's been some really nice research by a lady named Danielle Yakubovic showing the beneficial effects of having a smaller dinner. And the first study that she did looking at this was published in 2013. And basically what she did was took two groups of overweight and obese women. And over a period of 12 weeks, half of these women consumed half of their calories at breakfast. So this was the big breakfast group. And the other group consumed half their calories at dinner. So this was the big dinner group. Yeah. And what she found was that after 12 weeks, the big breakfast group lost more than twice as much body weight, more than twice as many inches off their waist, and had great improvements in blood sugar and blood lipids, even though both groups consumed exactly the same number of calories and the same proportions of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. That's extraordinary. It is. It's impressive, isn't it? And more recently, she's done other work looking at adults who have type 2 diabetes. And again, when you control for calorie intakes and macronutrient intakes, when people consume their food a bit earlier and have a very big breakfast that includes most of the day's carbohydrate intake, and about half of the day's calorie intake too, then after the same period of time, 12 weeks, only the group that has the big breakfast loses weight, but also they have much better blood sugar regulation. And in this particular study of these people who have type 2 diabetes, they found that over the course of these 12 weeks, the time that these people spent in a healthy blood sugar range increased by about 83%. And that's even though they were using lower doses of insulin to control their blood sugar. So this simple redistribution of carbohydrate and fat intake can have a really profound effect on metabolic health. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is, um, I mean, I've, I've long known that intermittent fasting suits me. And you've got me thinking a lot, actually, because certainly from a personal perspective, and I think most people who listen to this, a lot of people are familiar with intermittent fasting. And obviously, it's been a topic that's come up quite a bit over the last kind of six years or so that I've been doing this podcast. But mm. most people would do it fasting in the morning. And it seems mm -hmm. to really suit my digestion. I'm not really hungry in the morning anyway. I quite like being fasted in the morning. But once the floodgates open, Greg, I'm ravenous all, <laughs> all the way through until the end of the day. And then I, you know, I stop eating at seven or whatever. But yeah, that evening meal is a big one. That's what I, I think stopping at, say, three or four in the afternoon is, is the tough bit. Yeah. And that's understandable, especially because if you look at the heritability of different meal patterns, then it seems that if you look within a family, for example, then breakfast is the most heritable meal. So what some people, so what I mean by that is that if you look at twins, for instance, who are raised in different households, then twins that have the same genes, so identical twins raised in different households, will likely have very similar breakfast preferences. So it seems somewhat innate as to whether we are breakfast eaters or not. Yeah. And so it may be that breakfast is just something that doesn't suit some of us. Yeah. But dinner time seems less heritable. Mm -hmm. And the implication is that it may be more practical for people to focus more on changing their dinner. And I'll just throw something else in the mix here, which is that if you can stop consuming calories beyond a certain time each day, which is very much dependent on your lifestyle. So maybe you're a night owl and you have a family and you have dinner at 7 p.m. And so you decide that you're going to stop consuming calories at 8.30 p.m. 
but you're going to bed at midnight anyway. So that's not too problematic, most likely. But if you stop consuming your calories each day a bit earlier, then what you probably find is that the types of foods and drinks that you consume also changes. Because if you think about the temporal distribution of different items that you consume, then you'll probably realize that you're likely to consume things like breakfast cereals in the morning, mm. but not at night. Whereas late at night, you're probably disposed to consuming less healthy snacks. So maybe things like crisps and biscuits and popcorn and ice cream sat in front cheese. of the TV, cheese, eating mindlessly. And of course, also alcohol. And you mentioned before drinking a bit of alcohol late at night yeah. and that will certainly disrupt things like your heart rate variability and what you tend to find when people consume alcohol is that they'll fall asleep a little bit faster and they'll spend a greater proportion of the early sleep period and the deeper stage of sleep but then later in the evening as morning approaches their sleep tends to fragment and then if you measure them the next day then they're objectively impaired mm. and so using this type of early time restricted eating or just capping your calorie consumption at a certain time each day you're likely to not consume as many of those unhealthy snacks and maybe reduce your alcohol intake. And this is all very relevant at the moment because it seems based on some preliminary survey data that people's eating habits have got worse in the last few months. Have they? I mean, I, I kind of feel like my eating habits have got better because I've been eating more at home. Mm. But I've certainly been eating a lot more in general uh, because it's quite hard to isolate from the fridge when you're walking past it, isn't it? Yeah, and there's, of course, massive variability between people and how they responded during this time. And the more privileged among us probably have more control over our lifestyles and probably also aren't quite as stressed at this time yeah. as people who are less fortunate and so maybe we've been better able to preserve our health habits yeah. during this time yeah. and with that said the reason i mentioned that is that there was this study that looked at people across different continents including asia and africa and europe and some other countries too and they basically found that the lockdown period in particular negatively affected all different types of physical activity, people spent more time sitting, and people also made poorer dietary choices, they were more mindless in how they ate, they snacked more, and they were also disposed to <coughs> drinking alcohol, although binge drinking seemed to decrease. So in general, it seems that a lot of people, especially during the lockdown period, have, have been a bit less healthy than otherwise. But with that said, of course, as, as you're alluding to, it is possible at the moment to have more control over our schedules and to actually, I think, be healthier in some ways than it was previously. Some things are likely more disruptive than others, so our social lives, for instance, but if you look at how people's sleep has changed during this time, for instance, then it seems that for many people, their sleep has become more regular and also they're spending a bit longer in bed because a lot of people no longer have to wake up so early in the morning to commute. But at the same time, for most people, their sleep quality has deteriorated a, a fair bit of late, which probably relates to things like stress. Yeah, I mean, I, I do fear for, you know, so many, it was very well said what you said there about, you know, people who are a little bit luckier and a little bit younger are less stressed about things. I mean, talk about being forced to stare your own mortality in the face if you're over 70 or you've got a pre-existing condition and you're worried about mm -hmm. catching coronavirus. Um, and I do worry a lot that i'm certainly not one of the conspiracy theorists that says you know we should be just getting back to normal and the government's trying to control us and everything else um but i do worry for the the mental and physical health of so many people it's just so stressful isn't it and it's not kind of going away and i feel sorry for people you know you see them struggling down the street in a mask and you know keeping their two meters different distance from everyone else and you think life is pretty tough for people at the moment isn't it and probably even more so in less wealthy countries yeah, very much so. And perhaps <laughs> surprisingly, there's already actually been a systematic review of how the pandemic has affected people's mental health. Right. And surprise, surprise, what they found is that if you look at healthcare workers, then 
people seem to be experiencing high rates of depression and depressive symptoms and anxiety and psychological distress. And one of the things that you mentioned is that there's there's big variation between people in this. And it seems that women may be neg- more negatively affected than men are. And people with poorer health at baseline will also be more negatively affected. And regarding sleep specifically, it seems that insomnia is certainly more prevalent than it was previously, and that's contributing to some problems. If there's one mineral you should be worried about not getting enough of, it is magnesium. Magnesium is the body's master mineral, powerful and powering over 300 critical reactions, including detoxification, fat metabolism, energy, even digestion is influenced by the presence of magnesium. There's a problem here though, because magnesium has been largely missing from the soil since the 1950s. And that explains, maybe explains why 80% of us may be deficient. Luckily, this podcast is brought to you by Magnesium Breakthrough. It has been for the last couple of months. I know a lot of you are using it already. If you haven't got on the Magnesium Breakthrough gravy train, now might be the time. And you can head to bioptimizers.co.uk if you're in the US or bioptimizers, sorry, if you're in the UK and bioptimizers.com if you're anywhere else in the world. Let's just do that again bioptimizers.co.uk if you're in the UK and bioptimizers.com if you're anywhere else. Use the code ZESTOLOGY10 for 10% off. And the good news is when you do that, you get all seven forms of magnesium, all critical seven forms of magnesium. Pretty much every function in your body gets upgraded when you take the proper dosage of magnesium. And you can do that with Magnesium Breakthrough. And all the details are on the bottle about how much you can take and when you can take it and that kind of thing as well. I'm enjoying Magnesium Breakthrough tremendously. I hope you do as well. Head to bioptimizers with a z.co.uk. Use the code ZESTOLOGY10. And now back to the show. We were talking about fasting and intermittent fasting. Mm. And I think just before we recorded this podcast, I told you that I'm uh, looking at some of Walter Longo's work at the moment and the um, uh, fasting mimicking diet. And I'm not going to ask you specifically about what he does, but I just wonder... To what extent you look at slightly longer fasts with the people that you coach? I know you do a lot of coaching. You've coached sportsmen and women as well. Is there a role for that? Is there something that you like using on clients and with yourself as well? Yeah. So my default approach much of the time is to use some form of time-restricted eating. And I generally have people self-select their time-restricted eating period instead of trying to impose anything on them because I think that way they're more likely to comply with the guidance. But with that said, I make a distinction between intermittent fasting and and time-restricted eating, which a lot of people don't make, and this is all semantic, but when I refer to intermittent fasting, what I'm normally speaking about is the periodic use of a longer fast of 24 hours or more. Right. And I think that this definitely has its place. The way that I most often use it with people is at the start of a weight loss phase in people who are quite heavy to begin with. And the reasons for that are multiple. One of them is just that I think in our modern society, a lot of people don't really realize what hunger feels like. And going through that type of long fast can be quite educational for these people. Another is that for people who are very heavy at baseline, if you put them on a fasting approach, then they lose relatively more fat than leaner people. So you can take somebody who's very obese and put him or her on a water fast. And maybe if it's a very extended fast, you might add certain essential essential micronutrients too. But You can put them through that type of fast and they will hold on to most of their muscle mass and bone mass during that time. Whereas if you're a lean athlete to begin and you go on this type of long fast, then you're going to lose a lot of fat free mass too. So I think it's probably relatively more useful for people with poorer metabolic health at baseline. And then I think there are certain conditions when it can be quite handy and My impression of the research is that a lot of the discussion of this is quite speculative at the moment because there haven't been that many studies looking at clinical populations using this type of fasting. But certainly, I think for certain gastrointestinal issues, 
it might be helpful for people who are beginning certain types of diets. It can be handy. I mentioned earlier ketogenic diets. If someone's struggling to get into ketosis, then an extended fast at the start of a ketogenic diet may accelerate their entry into ketosis, which I think can be helpful. Right. But I think it's also something which is misused sometimes by relatively healthy people. A lot of hard charging individuals who work very hard and train very hard too are drawn to relatively extreme dietary approaches such as extended fasts. And the problem is that oh dear, that might be often, me. <laughs> yeah, much of the time these people are quite stressed at baseline. They've got families and they're working long hours and then they're spending their free time doing triathlons, for example. And they think, oh, I'm going to throw in a three day fast too. And for those people, I, I think it's frankly actually quite a bad idea for the most part. So as a rule of thumb, I would say if you're very heavy at baseline and you want to kickstart your fat loss, then it's really helpful. But for other people, I think modified fasting approaches can be very helpful. So there are a few of these and quite often the way that people will implement these is they'll use something like alternate day fasting. And if this is modified, then they might, for example, consume about 25% of how many calories they need on their so-called fasting days. So they're not truly fasting, they're modified fasting. And I think if people use this, then it makes sense to use what's called a protein sparing modified fast, in which most of those calories come from dietary protein, because consuming that dietary protein will help them hold on to their fat-free mass which is very important to multiple facets of metabolic health, including things like how much muscle mass they carry and therefore how well they dispose of glucose and also their appetite regulation. If you look at all of the different macronutrients, so carbs, fats and proteins and also alcohol, then protein tends to be the most satiating. It's the most filling per calorie. So going on a high protein diet on those modified fasting days can make them a bit more straightforward for people yeah. to implement. And then also I think the sort of five to approach can be quite helpful. And if anything, I think the research suggests that at least in theory, having those two modified fasting days back to back makes sense as opposed to spacing them out. But if you want to start trying a complete fast, a 24 hour water fast, for instance, I'd say maybe throw in one a week and then you can increase the frequency of that if you find it helpful. So you might start with one every seven days and then move to one every six days and then one every five days. But I probably wouldn't do more than two complete 24 hour fasts a week. Yeah. I mean, what about one a month <laughs> or one a, or one every six months? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's better than yeah. nothing, isn't it? But I mean, actually, if you're doing a 24 hour fast, I'm very interesting. You know, we talk about the chronobiology and um, on your Instagram, you've got a, um, a graphic uh, mm -hmm. to show the relationship between clock time of the largest meal of the day, dinner and death rate at the mm -hmm. time of when coronavirus started in Europe. Um, which is very interesting and obviously correlates with a lot of what we talked about. And, and I wonder if, you know, I'm thinking about the practicalities of my life and also the fact that I like eating an evening meal. It's already pretty early, kind of five thirty, six o'clock, but it is my oh, yeah. biggest meal of the day. If you were to then do a fast once a week or once every couple of weeks or um, a fasting mimicking diet every three months, would that mitigate some of the effects of eating later? Yeah, quite possibly. I, th I think it's difficult to say. And I think this is another one of those instances where a bit of self-experimentation is due. But for you, Tony, I, I would say, why not? Tinker with it, see how you get on. And I think that is another instance when fasting is helpful. If you've been through a period in which you've overindulged, so maybe January the second rolls round and yeah. you've had your christmas splurge and then your new year's bender and you want to get back on the straight and narrow i think a 24-hour fast can be a useful way to kick start your progress yes yeah what, what about the um obviously circadian rhythms are very important to you i've had uh, sachin panda on my podcast i really really like his work and i've read his mm. book as well um one of the things i mean i've 
selfishly asking you about all sorts of things that I'm very interested in. And mm -hmm. I, I, I tend to work quite late at Sky. Tonight I'm finishing at 11, which almost seems quite early compared to some of the finishes. But, you know, I'll be clambering to bed about 11.30, which is an hour later than normal. Mm -hmm. um, what do you... I know you work with people who sometimes are dealing with jet lag and are dealing with kind of uh, intense jobs or um, third shift work how do you help them cope with that yeah i could give you a very long answer on this but what i'll do instead is i'll, I'll confine my answer primarily to nutrition and i think that for shift workers what makes sense is trying to stick to a regular time restricted eating period when possible and maybe that's only possible on four or five days each week and you should pick the timing of that period based on what's practical in the context of your life. But as before, having it during what I refer to as your biological daytime, which is that time of day when you would naturally be awake. Because if you're a shift work, if you're a shift worker, then you probably spend quite a few hours each week when you're awake and active at times when your body is promoting sleep. But anyway, confining your time restricted eating period to your biological daytime when possible. And then during shift, so let's say that you're working a night shift that finishes at 6 a.m. If that's the case and you find yourself ravenous in the middle of that shift, then what I would say is that it just makes sense to consume a small snack during that time. And there's been some nice research on this in recent years. And Basically, what it's shown is that if people consume a small snack containing, let's say, 10% of their daily calorie intake, then they'll tend to have better mental performance during the shift. And this has been looked at via things like simulated driving performance. So this is very relevant to the safety of some workers, too. Mm -hmm. But also, interestingly, this type of small snack may reduce hunger to a similar degree to a larger meal about three times the number of calories in the snack. And one thing that many shift workers will be familiar with is that if they consume substantial quantities of food during a night shift, then they'll have more digestive discomfort than normal. And having a smaller snack will offset that. So I would say for these people, consume a small snack, make it high in protein, high in fiber, relatively low in carbs, low in fats. And then there are other things that people can do during their shifts to support their performance. So for example, there's been some work published recently showing that if people do a short bout of exercise at the start of their shift, then they may support their cognition, but also their ability to fall asleep after the shift. And then otherwise, because a lot of people don't have too much control over their shift schedules, doing what they can to make their sleep as restorative as possible is really important. Mm. And what that means is engaging in all of those sleep hygiene behaviors that I'm sure you've discussed many times before on your podcast, Tony. So things like being careful about your exposure to light shortly before you fall asleep and making sure that you block out any daylight from your bedroom in your post shift sleep. Yeah. And also attending to things like when you eat relative to your sleep and I think if, if people start there, then that would be helpful. But also I recognize that there are systemic issues at play too here. And there's been a lot of work in recent years looking at things like chronotype personalized shift schedule. Chronotype is the idea that there are some of us who are naturally morning larks and others are night owls. And what you find is that if you remove the most strenuous shift for a given chronotype, so morning larks will find night shifts hardest and night owls will find morning shifts hardest. If you get rid of just that one most difficult shift for these people, then they will report better quality of life and higher sleep quality. So I think when it's possible to personalize people's shifts according to their biological clocks, the onus is really on the powers that be to make those changes because they're going to have happier and more productive workers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, 
we're not at the stage yet where people are encouraging people to sleep at work very much, but they really should. It would make a massive. I love. I love an afternoon nap, and it definitely makes me operate better afterwards. Yeah, um, and a, yeah. a ten a ten minute nap can be very restorative. It doesn't yeah. need to be a long nap, and if you keep your nap to ten minutes or so, and obviously you need to factor for the consideration that you're going to take a bit of time to fall asleep. So maybe a ten minute nap is actually a thirty minute period, but a ten minute nap will have quite substantial effect on cognitive performance and physical performance when somebody hasn't got enough sleep or when somebody's been up for a long period of time. And if the nap is short, then they're less likely to enter deeper stages of sleep. And if they wake from deep stage of sleep, then they're more likely to feel groggy. But also a shorter nap is less likely to disrupt sleep later that day. So just just 10 minutes will have a lot of different beneficial effects if if your workplace allows that of course we um we were doing yoga nidra which basically turned into a nap every day on holiday and it was absolutely delightful uh yeah, <laughs> highly highly recommend it now listen greg what is one book that you would recommend and one tip for living with more energy and vitality obviously we cover quite a lot but um one book uh, and one tip should the book be about health well, it doesn't have to be. I mean, you know, I am a great fan of fiction. It could be just one of your favourite books. Uh, it could be anything at all. The book that I'd recommend is 80,000 Hours by Benjamin Todd. And the idea is that on average, each of us spends about 80,000 hours at work over the course of our adult lives. And what the book does is take a rational approach to helping people select their career choices. And I read it at a time when I was unsure about what I wanted to do in my life. And I was toying with a few different ideas and I found it hugely informative and helpful in making certain career choices. And I think that it's relevant to pretty much everybody who is of working age listening to this because on average people change jobs several times over the course of their lives. And I suspect that people will change jobs more often going forward than they did previously because yeah. the, the nature of society is changing so quickly. So I would say check out 8,000 hours and I believe that it's available as a free PDF online too. Great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything's changed, doesn't it, over the last few weeks and months. Um, what about one tip then for living with more energy and vitality? My tip would be to incorporate a stress management practice in your life, whatever that might be. I think this is more relevant now than it used to be it doesn't need to be a formal mindfulness meditation practice, for instance. It could be doing yoga. It could be going on a mindful walk each day. It could be sitting down late in your day and listing your concerns and alongside those concerns, listing different things that you can do to amend those concerns. And if there aren't things that you can do to address them, then just list that. That's fine. But I think right now, a lot of people really feel under the cosh. And so having a way to better cope with those stresses is likely to benefit multiple aspects of their lives. And this is very relevant to things like sleep, too. When you take people who, for example, have insomnia and you have them begin a regular mindfulness meditation practice or you have them go through some of those types of cognitive therapies, they will tend to see quite dramatic improvements in their sleep quality. And if your sleep improves, then you are going to have more energy. So I'd probably start there. Yeah, that, uh, Greg, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, nothing, all the supplements in the world, all the time restricted eating, nothing beats a good night's sleep, does it? It doesn't. No. no. Um, preach the fire. Yeah. It's well, and it's um, it's quite tough with a baby as well. I have to say, but um, mm. but we're getting there. It just means you have to be very strict about when you turn out the light. 
Um, and it means if you're on holiday, you seem a bit boring if you're going going back to the room at like 10 o'clock at night and everyone else is settling in for a few drinks. But, you know, sleep has to has to trump everything. Uh, Greg, it's been really good to talk to you. Where can people find out more about you and also resilient nutrition? Because obviously we've spoken a lot about nutrition and I think that uh, people would love to know more about that as well. Yeah, people can find out more about me by going to my social media accounts, which are at Greg Potter PhD, which sounds very self-indulgent, but it was just because <laughs> at Greg Potter was taken. So I really don't like that handle, but so be it. I also have a website, which is gregpotterphd.com, which I desperately need to updress, but haven't done so. And then to check out Resilient Nutrition, go to at Resilient Nuts on social media or resilientnutrition.com. And just quickly to describe what our first product is it's basically a really tasty whole food based nut butter which is enhanced by cutting edge science to boost your stamina and keep you calm and alert and bolster your resilience and we have different versions of the product which are better suited to different times of day so we've got an energized product which is designed to support things like performance during exercise and also cognition at work we have a calm product which is better suited to any time of day, whereas the energized product is better suited to the mornings or pre-workout. And I particularly like the Calm product in the evening. Both of these are available with added protein too. And all these products contain clinically proven doses of the best studied forms of the active ingredients. And I'm biased, but they really do taste good. And we try and be very careful with everything that we do at the company and so for example all of our packaging is recyclable we avoid certain ingredients which we think are probably detrimental for the environment and we also give one percent of our sales to a charity named the coalition for rainforest nations which basically works with communities and governments to protect rainforests because they're hotspots of biodiversity and they're important in mitigating climate change too so hopefully by supporting that charity we will more than offset any negative effects that we have on the environment ourselves so i'm really proud of what we're doing and and we just launched but check out resilientnutrition.com if any of that's of interest definitely uh sounds brilliant i definitely will be checking that out Uh, greg thanks so much it's been brilliant to talk let's do it again at some point soon fantastic thanks tony we didn't even get onto sardinia you moving there next month (laughs) i'm not jealous at all (laughs) next time next time thank you to greg potter phd great to speak to greg really enjoyed that and i'll look forward to chatting to greg again soon i'm still strolling around west london at the moment just before i finish this podcast like to direct you to the fact that i send out a uh, newsletter every monday morning sometimes it's tuesday or wednesday morning but that's it's just a childcare thing (laughs) if the baby's around on a monday morning i don't have time to write a newsletter but i'll do it on tuesday or wednesday instead Um, and it's kind of all the stuff that i've been looking into every week hacks tweaks and tricks for more energy vitality and motivation quite a bit of biohacking in there often a lot of exercise based stuff obviously i've been looking a lot into longevity and dr volta lungo recently so i've been talking a little bit about that um hoping to do the fasting mimicking diet shortly i've been talking about that on the email if you head to tonywriting.com you can sign up for that and uh yeah you'll get my ramblings it takes about two and a half minutes to read the email so it's not too bad And a quick thank you to my podcast partners, that is Magnesium Breakthrough, a sensational magnesium supplement that, as you probably know by now if you've been listening to Zestology, I take every day. It is um, it's just the complete bioavailable form of magnesium. Seven different forms of supplemental magnesium in one supplement. I'm, I'm very excited about what my friends over at Bioptimizers that the makers of actually they don't just make magnesium they make all sorts of industry leading digestive supplements um, but magnesium breakthrough I, I do think this is the ultimate magnesium supplement all seven forms of this mineral even including trace amounts of something called monoatomic magnesium helps make all the other forms more bioavailable hey you learn a new thing every day so if you fancy a bit of monoatomic magnesium 
and all those different forms of supplemental magnesium, then head to bioptimizers.co.uk uh, or bioptimizers.com if you're anywhere else in the world apart from the UK. Use the code ZESTOLOGY10 at checkout for 10% off and um, you will be good to go. Let me know how you get on as well. Uh, ZESTOLOGY10 and um, some building work comes at exactly the wrong time. It's, it's very noisy around here at the moment, isn't it? Anyway, I'll, I'll finish the podcast so they can carry on. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. <laughs>